Hello, my name is John, and today we're looking at the MiG-21 BIS. We're just looking at the outside of it, obviously because it has been released yet, but I thought I might well as well do a video about some of the features and some of the technical data about the aircraft while looking at some of the aspects of the 3D module. So let's get started, and um, let's start right with some technical data. And the aircraft itself has a maximum speed of 1,300 kilometers per hour, or 2.05 Mach. Uh, so basically, at high altitude, probably the Mach limit will be at your concerning factor, and at lower altitude, this will be the kilometer per hour limit. And um, the aircraft itself can pull up to 8G under curtain conditions, uh, under a low, uh, under a curtain speed, and under curtain fuel load. And uh, with more fuel or more speed, and with different external stores, the um, amount of cheese you can pull will gradually decrease uh, down to 7, 6, 5, or even less cheese, depending on your load. The maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft is 9,800 kilograms, which can be exceeded for a, by a bit under curtain circumstances. But um, 9,800 kilograms is the norm, and the landing weight is three tons less than that, 6,800 kilograms, which just leaves you with about 700 liters of fuel, uh, which is not much. Actually, it's just so much that you can do one more go around, for example, if you fail a landing. So if you, for example, approach and someone is blocking the runway or you're unstable and you go around, you have about enough fuel to do one more approach and after that you will have a uh, quite a big problem <laughs> because you will run out of fuel. This makes the aircraft quite difficult to uh, fly under bad weather conditions because especially if you try to do an instrument approach with the PRGM um, it might not uh, be possible to land on the first try and um, it just leaves you for a small traffic pattern under bad visibility to try to land again. So that's always something you want to keep in mind when, fly the, when flying the aircraft, that you don't land with too much fuel aboard, but also be trying to fly a stable approach, maybe let yourself a bit more time for approach to um, make sure it's a stable approach than to have an unstable approach and go around and then might not have enough fuel to actually land. But that's just some statistics. Um, Let's look at the aircraft itself and let's start in the front. The very first thing we can see here on the left hand side of the aircraft is the, or on the front end of the aircraft is the pitot tube, the long pipe that uh, basically extends past all the other aircraft features, which allows the pitot tube to be in the clean airflow, which is not distorted by the airframe or any turbulences the airframe might create. And um, this is not very often seen nowadays on, say, Western jets or Western, yeah fighters or western airplanes but um, it's quite a interesting design which is often used during flight tests for example if they test out a new airliner they also will use a similar system with a long needle or long tube extending in front of the aircraft to be in the clean air to check if the instruments are correct and to have an excellent source and here in the MiG this is the main speed source and also has some feints for AOA and uh, slip measuring I would assume and um, it's, it is the pitot tube is heatable, obviously, to prevent icing and to not lose your instruments. And from what I can tell, this is um, simulated in the MiG-21, as much more of such nice details are. Next thing we're looking at here under a red cover as well is the engine nose cone. And the nose cone actually moves depending on the speed you fly and depending on some conditions. For example, if you um, extend the landing gear, the nose cone will fully retract into the aircraft, leaving maximum airflow to the engine. But on higher speeds, for example on 1.8 Mach, the nose cone will extend to 40%. So it will come outward, basically closing down the engine inlet and uh, letting less air into the engine. Which is a similar design which also has or could be seen on the S-71 where the engine nose cone would move depending on the speed to perform engine air inlet behavior and also jets like the F-15 have movable engine inlets 
And the MIG has this as well, and um, it's a key element to the engine operation. If you if you lose the nose cone, the automatic control, you will have a kind of interesting or difficult problem because you then have to take care of the nose cone movement yourself, which you can do if the nose cone still is movable. If if it's not, uh, if you, for, for example, lose the systems driving it, the electric systems driving it, it will automatically fully extend, leaving you in quite a bit of a difficult situation because especially if this combined with other failures, say a nozzle failure, but also on its own can cause the engine to run rough, vibrate or even surge and fail. So once you when you lose your nose cone you will have quite a delicate situation going on and you probably want to return to your nearest friendly airfield as soon as possible. Another thing housed in the nose is the sapphire radar. It's um, very, a very early raise radar, as to expect, and is quite limited. Therefore, for example, you cannot like move the radar left and right as you can do in a more modern jet. The only thing, the radar is fixed. You can move it just a bit in the elevation range to actually compensate for ground clutter. But else, you will have to live with plus minus 30 degrees in azimuth and minus 1.5 degrees up to plus 17 degrees in elevation. And uh, this also leads that um, most of the radar is looking up for, uh, wards, therefore, so you normally want to come in below your target, which you will intercept, basically will want to be uh, 100, 200 meters below the target, and maybe t um, 10, 15 kilometers behind it to see it well on the radar screen. The maximum indicated range of the radar is 30 kilometers, obviously a fighter sized target might show up just close of that or maybe just closer to you maybe in 20 kilometer distance and the radar is quite limited in its operational time first of all it needs three to five minutes to spool up or heat up better then it can be in standby for about 35 to 40 minutes and it can be operated continuously for the whole flight for about 20 to 25 minutes and this is limited by the amount of cooling fluid you will have a board. It's it's an alcohol mixture which you use um, and cool which cools the radar during flight. And obviously, it is in a small I think several liters only in a bottle, and once that runs empty, your radar will start to get hot, and you will have to switch it off. And um, this shows actually what the aircraft is very much or was very much designed for. It was a Cold War interceptor, fast interceptor. It's designed to go fast, it's designed to take off, react to a target quickly, engage for example an enemy bomber, destroy the enemy bomber and land again. You don't have much f more fuel than that. You cannot stay and loiter around in for example a target area and pr provide good, sh a good cover for your friendly aircraft or anything like that. You have just enough fuel on the normal aircraft um, for a small or fast intercept mission and also the radar is quite limited so it's it's nothing like a modern F-15 which can loiter in the target area for hours and provide cover to the friendlies. You can loiter in the target area for a couple of minutes, maybe half an hour or even an hour if you have external tanks but at, at least at then it will it will be time to go back. And um, this is also why the aircraft is just an interceptor and it it is designed for being fast, intercepting fast, striking hard and then returning. So that's something you want to keep in mind, especially when designing missions, but also flying them. Uh, now let's continue looking a bit further back at the aircraft. Um, in here, I think it's on the left hand side if I'm not mistaken, we have the 23mm GSH-23 cannon. It's a double barrel cannon which has 250 rounds in stock and um, those 250 rounds are fired within 4 seconds if you squeeze down the trigger. Oh, I'm sorry. And um, the cannon itself is quite interestingly loaded by explosives. You have three explosive chargers which will load the weapon and for example if the weapon jams you will have to use one more of those explosive chargers to load the weapon again. So basically when starting the flight you can first load the weapon with one explosive charge and then it can jam up to two times until you will have to return to the airfield to get the weapon unjammed and the explosive charges reloaded. 
but being such an old aircraft is, is I guess is a design <laughs> which was very easy to do back in the day and won't be found very often today anymore. Um, looking at the aircraft itself, you can see the nice wheel chocks and fire extinguisher and covers, um, leather and simulations included, which looks very nice. And uh, looking here under the wing, we have the main landing gear, which is which is quite sturdy. It was designed to land on open fields and not much prepared fields and dirt roads and stuff like that. And um, I have been told stories about, for example, if um, flight of maybe say four MiG-21 approach an airport and um, the first MiG-21 lands and for example it has a flat tire or for any reason it cannot vacate the runway quickly enough and um, the other aircraft would still be in the air what they would do because they wouldn't have much fuel to go to another airport they would actually go ahead and land either on the taxiway or even on the field next to the runway because the aircraft was capable of doing that but it was not capable of flying to an alternate airport because the limited amount of fuel you had aboard so the landing gear is quite sturdy I'll be interested if you can land in fields in the simulation as well probably and <laughs> looking forward to that as well anyway what we have also under the wings is uh, two of the many weapon, or not of the many, of the five or six weapon pilots the aircraft can carry. And we have a wide variety of weapons actually. We have unguided rockets, guided missiles, air to air as well, air, air to ground, and fuel pods, as well as gun pods. And um, this gives us quite a, I guess, this will give us quite a lot to play with and have fun with and also which can be mounted here under board under under the fuselage of the aircraft then um, is um, the jammer uh, radar jammer a basic radar jammer and a flare chaff dispenser I think it's also combined with the jammer so that's some stuff we already can look for as well forward to as well and um, I think also what will also be simulated is the tactical nuclear weapons or at least the training tactical nuclear weapons including the systems or switch panels in the cockpit necessary to drop them which will be quite interesting and I'm looking forward to a video to do a video on that as well now let's move behind the aircraft and look at the tail which is also obviously the engine exhaust uh, where the engine exhaust is taking <laughs> or finding its place and again we have uh, movable parts here the engine exhaust nozzle as with any jet nowadays or any military jet nowadays is expandable in size it can change its size depending on the thrust setting and um, the more thrust you add the smaller uh, the nozzle will get until the pointer will engage after burner then the nozzle will increase its diameter and you have the maximum power you ha we have two afterburners aboard the MiG-21. The first afterburner was the normal afterburner, which was on the very first MiG-21 as well. But then the engineers came to the conclusion that it might that the aircraft, given the new roles it had to assume, needs a bit more power, and they added a second or emergency afterburner. And um, obviously, the afterburner is costing away quite a lot of fuel, so the time in it is quite limited. But um, it will be used, I guess, for takeoff, and it will be quite handy for escaping any dangerous situations or anything like that. And um, talking about the engine nozzle again, it's similar to the nose cone. If you lose control over that or lose automatic control over the engine nozzle diameter, it will come into a bit of a troubleful situation because the engine will start to lose power. It will start to lose uh, its performance. It may run rough, vibrate again, or at worst even start to surge. And this leaves you quite in a delicate situation again. And you might want to return to the nearest airfield immediately. And it's definitely a situation where you would be preparing to eject. Maybe you can attempt a landing, at the, uh, a landing but um, if that doesn't go very well would have to check. For example, if the nozzle fails fully open in afterburner and you go out of afterburner, the nozzle won't close anymore. You can still fly in a horizontal level flight. You can climb a bit and you can obviously descend, but as soon as you extend the landing gear or extend the flaps, you just will descend. You cannot even keep the altitude anymore. So um, it's uh, it's not very easy to fly 
the aircraft back to the airfield anymore. You have to be quite careful about your control inputs, also about speeds and altitudes you fly at. But I, I guess um, this will come in quite interesting when taking fire and taking damage by the enemy in the MiG-21. If you lo start to lose multiple system, it will sure get very challenging to fly the aircraft back home. Another thing we can look at here is um, in this long tube just above the engine outlet, there are the parachute sits and the parachute is used for after landing situations to break down the aircraft or slow down the aircraft to a stopping speed. And um, you would also use the would also use the air brakes for that and as well as the wheel brakes which are using pressure, um, air pressure or pressurized air, which is um, which the aircraft cannot produce itself, you have that on a bottle, you're also limited on the amount of braking attempts you can do, so this will be as a quite challenging to actually fly, because if you, for example, waste a lot of air during taxi, and you come in for landing, you pro will be surprised that you don't have any brakes anymore, or less braking force and stuff like that, so it's quite a lot to keep in mind while flying this aircraft. Obviously, it's an old aircraft, it's very advanced, it doesn't have much systems to help you, although it it is somewhat automated in some regards, but this is truly will truly be a pilot's aircraft, I, I assume. Another thing here at the back, very important obviously, are the control surfaces, the horizontal and the vertical stabilizer, as well as the rudder and the elevator. And the elevator, um, might also know this from other flight simulators or other aircraft, the elevator is quite um, um, dependable, the elevator force or the elevator effect is quite dependable on the speed you fly at. You can even notice this in a small Cessna, if you fly at a low speed, the elevator won't have as much authority as it would have at a higher speed. And this is the very same for this aircraft here. And it's, it even gets worse if you go over the Mach 1 limit and you fly Mach 1.5 for example. The elevator input will be quite devastating if you basically full pull back the stick fully. So the engineers knew that and um, they went ahead and designed a system, the ARU system it's called, which basically adjusts the deflection between the stick and the elevator throughout the flight. For example, the faster and higher you are, the more different uh, elevator input or the output of the elevator will be, or the movement of the elevator will be compared to your stick input. Well, for example, on the ground, the full pull on a stick to the full backwards position will fully uh, move the elevator to its up position. In high speed cruise it only might move it just a very slight bit to prevent the aircraft from over and losing control. Which is quite interesting for the age. And it's another system you don't actually want to lose the automatic mode in. If you start to lose the automatic mode, there is still the possibility to control it manually, but you have to be very careful because this is a quite a delicate system and it also change, changes how the aircraft behaves. For example, if you're used to the system working and it suddenly doesn't work anymore, the, you, the amount of force you have to put on your stick will change quite a, a huge amount. So it's uh, very important to keep an eye on that as well. And if it fails, you obviously would want to RTB as soon as possible. And this was this small exterior tour about the MiG-21. Uh, I'm not sure how how this video actually turns out to be. If, if you liked it, leave comments below and tell me so, and I can talk some more about the MiG-21 in an upcoming video. And I'm also very looking forward to actually doing some tutorials on it once it's released and therefore thank you very much for watching and have a great day see you soon